Hello everyone, now let's see if this is working. It's always an interesting question, is it working? Is the connection going to work? I have to admit I have taken the stream down just ever such a tad on its normal live production because, well, honestly, I was worried about it tonight. I was worried about it because, well, must be honest, I'm doing it over hotel Wi-Fi. Which is always fun to do. Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Now, please note, I have the questions up there, the live chat. And tonight is going to be slightly different because I've already done these all as a presentation. I've done a very long series of videos on them. So tonight is more about me responding to questions than anything else. Mainly because that means I don't have to play around with the slides quite as much and hopefully don't destroy the computer system. Hello everyone. Right then. So, speaking of it, hoping that you can all hear me clearly and that the sound control is working fine. And this evening, well, I do have Coke by the pint available. It's a pretty nice place to stay. And you might see there is a sort of bobbly head wandering around at various points because I still have a certain fluffy research assistant traveling companion who basically, you know, as far as he's concerned, I am his chauffeur. And that is how it should always be. So, hello everyone. One thing I do need to get out. Oh, I really don't need to keep that. I'm fine. I can just about do this myself. I can, I can get one of these smart as a mouse. Makes things easier. Hello. Right then. Then if I have the mouse, then I can go up and down the chat. Hello, Carl McGuesberg. Hello, Ron Cash. Hi, John Shea. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. Hello, 96831. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, George W. Newman. Hello, HMS Burdon. Ooh, good lord. Lots of questions already from 96831. Okay. Hi, Stafford Thompson. Hello, Ronan Cash. Hello, Tana Ferka. Hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, Polymus. Oh, wait, just hold on. Interesting. Hello, C. Dodders. Hello, DG40. Hello, George Newman. Hello, everyone. That's good. Fluffy hotel. Um, well, fluffy friendly hotel. Um, a very nice place. Not the fluffy does think it's far more friendly than he than it is because earlier he decided to jump up and try and order him for himself from the bar and I got told he's not supposed to he's not I did tell him no um yeah yeah the, it today's shot was a fun thing to do but it's the trouble is it you you try and say some of those names with a straight face, and it's just a case of, oh my lord! The, uh, the trouble is, what flashes through me, and this is uh, my mind when I'm talking about the gay class and I'm going through their names in the six seconds, is that the number of jokes and double entendres that you know uh, that the Royal Navy must have got through, and I'm so surprised there wasn't a carry on film made about them because honestly they that would have been right up their street. Even in the, right, Dunrick Ironhammer, I think you've got the first question is. Even the even doctor, excuse me for a moment while I borrowed the hardest to go back and hit the Norwegian government in the head with his book until they resign. You don't even need to really hit them in the head or head of a history book, just shout a warning at someone and go, actually pay attention this time, please. That's slightly better. I'm slightly more lit up there. Um, yes, this all came about from Wayne Boring's suggestion, of course, so thank you to Wayne for this. Do an evaluation of each combat and Navy model to and give us your list of their top five weaknesses in order, why those weaknesses existed, and how those weaknesses could have been addressed. Well, I did that, but to an extent, there are certain things I did skip, like the German productivity for, um, you know, believing their codes was in, were infallible. And it's just that's not something which the Navy would have to fix. That's the entire country has that belief. That's beyond the reach of the Navy. You could do point out the Navy could have changed their own codes. Yes, they could have. But the trouble is, 
there are so many other services who are using the same codes that the Navy might change their codes, but at some point someone will do it, send a translation of a signal in their in, in the old code, and that will allow the the British to try and figure out how to break it. I think the problem I have with this scenario is that no matter what you change, you make the outcome is inevitable. The access will lose. Um, yes, but that's because of infrastructure. And that surely tells you how stupid it was for them to actually be waging war in the first place. If the only way you can change it so they can win is to basically change the entire combatants and the structure of the combatants involved, then that suggests that it was a pretty stupid war to begin with, which makes all the loss of life even more pointless than it was beforehand. Um, plus, in the case it's, in the case it's too late for the British, as frankly, they haven't got time to get the stuff they needed. The only way these changes can work is if they come between 34 and 38. Um, a good example of my point is the collision between Hood and Renown in 35 was bluntly the British Britain's last chance to prevent the catastrophe at um, Denmark Straits, and they let it slip by. Yes and no. And um, let me explain why yes and no. Actually, the British could have done some stuff in 1939, as I carried out, as I explained. And you'd be surprised at the knock-on effect of various things. Because something, someone was talking to me about it. This was actually, this may have been one of my former uh, supervisors, and I only really speak to one of them uh, from my PhD, um, regularly, because the other one I didn't really make friends with. I'll say, well, and might have, in discussion with that gentleman and um, a couple of others, the topic might have come up of these videos. And the discussion might have gone along the lines of, but if there'd been more carriers available, then there would have probably been their carrier for each task group. And that immediately changed my mindset, because if you have more carriers available early in the war, you probably have a greater strike at Taranto. If you have a greater strike at Taranto, because let's say you have two armoured carriers ready and they both involve more strike on Taranto, then you have the Italians lose a lot, lot more ships. Possibly Creek doesn't fall, possibly it does fall, but leave that to one side. The knock-on impact is probably going to mean that there's also another carrier available for the North, uh, the North, uh, the home fleet, North Atlantic, and that means you're going to have carrier task groups. So that would mean that Hood and Prince of Wales would have an aircraft carrier with them, and that changes things because if they have a carrier with them. A, they probably see the German. They may probably detect the Germans earlier because they'll have a stage. Will by that point definitely have standing air patrol. But it would also mean there might have been an airstrike involved, and there also might be greater coordination of the various different groups involved. Uh, different groups involved from having the carrier. So it suddenly changes a lot of things if you change that 1939 force to carry decision. And as I've made the point in this in the videos repeatedly, there was a strong case made against that decision based on the need for aircraft carriers for anti-submarine warfare and commerce protection. Uh, the need, those carriers were needed for those roles, and they were desperately needed for those roles. And the Navy knew it, and the Navy made the case. And so you just have to change that one decision, and you can change a lot of losses. Now, it's a pebble in the pond, but it's a big pebble. How does it affect... The interesting question then goes, well, how does that affect the procurement of things like uh, flower-class corvettes? Not very much, but hunt-class escort destroyers, perhaps it does slow them down. And then, of course, that has consequences in other areas, or there again, but there we might be able to grow the hunt-class escort destroyer program uh, just as quickly anyway, because there were some delays to that in terms of finding enough turbines, etc. So... There were natural bo uh, bottlenecks which wouldn't have been affected, which meant that actually eh, having a reduction in builders available by enough to be still carrying on the carrier program would probably not have affected things in the wash. It might have changed some of the delivery dates by a week or so here and there, but overall, it probably wouldn't have affected things uh, dramatically, whereas the carrier involvement could well have done so. Everyone, I know it's likely it's too late by then, but I can't help but think the way to solve most of the Allied fleet problems is to have a set of naval treaties that people are happy with rather than the put they will put up with. 
Well, as I explained when I was talking about the equitable treaty series, the reason one designs an equitable treaty and evaluates treaties by that is because equitable treaties by their nature are usually mutually beneficial for everyone to keep to. That's the point of them. They're not, they don't give everyone everything they want, but they give people enough of what they want that they keep to it. And that is the trick when designing a treaty. It's making it equitable. It's making enough that people will keep to it. Because in the end, the only way you can keep a nation state to a treaty is if they choose to keep to it. So there has to be an incentive for them, no matter what the government change, uh, changes the government, to stick to that treaty. So it's got to be equitable. Um, Rokash, I understand a little bit about the process of producing heavy gun battle, or Dr. Clark, but what are the major limiting factors, and is there any way to speed up the process? It's the quality of the material you have to work with, and it's the heating and rolling, and the heating and rolling, and heating and rolling. Uh, a gun barrel is possibly one of the strongest, if not the strongest, steel we produce. It's, to an extent, even stronger than armor plate, and it's... It, it, producing an armor bar a, 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 a gun barrel and then rifling it for the desired effect and impact for these ships that is that is as, as high tech as you can get that is sending a man to mars level tech requirements for the 1920s and 1930s so you're dealing with something which is very 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 critical. There isn't really any way to speed it up. The only way really to speed it up the process is to actually have more facilities available for the process. And preferably have some of those facilities be buried underground so they can't be interrupted by people dropping bombs. Hello, daughters. Um... One way to remove the eye fleet would be to remove John Saul and Dalan from their posts. Ah, it's always a help, but it's not particularly... It, honestly, just giving them f uh, different instructions would probably work it out. They both follow instructions. It's never could I get the hang of physics. I think it's Friday. I, I, I chose not to do Thursday because I honestly... Um, the lovely people at Armchair Admiral said, well, we want to do Armchair Admirals on that day. I went, yes, please do that on that day because then I can do my live on the Friday. And I'm in the hotel which has the better Wi-Fi signal on the Friday. I too. I wondered, I'm taking an idea for, oh, hello, Amelia Burrow, and hello, Leo, and hello, I O too. I too. I and taking an idea from your treaty series, I wonder how much difference HMS Tiger still being around would have changed. Depends what she's armed with. If she's been upgraded to have 14-inch guns, not a theoretically impossibility, and she's wandering around, then she's probably very useful in the early phase for hunting down the Deutschland class. And she could well have been deployed to places like the Indian Ocean, etc. In hunting surface raiders. She wouldn't have been something deployed in the Mediterranean or even the North Atlantic. But she could well have been hunting surface raiders in the ocean, which could have presented a very interesting scenario because it might have been that instead of HMS Sydney coming across the Comoran, it could have been HMS Tiger with 14-inch guns, which would have probably been a slightly different scenario. Um... Because I still, to this day, think the reason Sydney got close was she was trying to go for a boarding action. And I think, therefore, she'd have had a lot of crew on deck ready to go into boats to board. Because I think they were trying to... They knew uh, One of their ideas was to try and get merchant... Capture merchant ships because they it was one of the orders and criteria going around. So I think they were trying to capture her. Whereas if they'd been slightly less ambitious they'd have probably stood off further and the further they stand off the more of a chance they have because the trouble is once you get uh, the, you, the armor and protection you have only gives you protection at range at point blank gun range for 16 uh, for guns uh six inch caliber point rank range is not as close as you'd imagine um yeah 
that's their problem. Uh, but no, Tiger would have been in the ocean wandering around. Therefore, could have been a third member of Task Force uh, of Force Z, which is also another interesting scenario. Um, Tiger wandering around as a third member of Force Z. I, it's interesting to it's more interesting to think not the fourteen inch guns would have been on probably they'd have ended up going with six fourteen inch guns. Use the weight save to improve the secondary element. Probably the pending, probably considering the period, probably for they'd have probably mon, uh, done the modernization, probably mid 30s. So, would probably have gone with four and a half inch guns because the 5.25s were still being iffy and they were saving them to an extent. So, would it be you're probably looking for a tiger which has mm, four. Twin 4.5s each side, and um, three twin 14-inch guns set up A, B, and Y turret, probably. That's a kind of Did um, Churchill forget the Iron Fleet was in the middle of modernization, as the old one stuff is still getting in the front of the collection on the moor? Not really, but... He just thought he was, in the nicest way, he remembered the big lesson from World War I was they didn't have enough escorts, and they concentrated on building a massive battle fleet, and the Germans didn't have a battle fleet in World War II. They didn't have much of a fleet of anything, so build escorts. Which is actually really kind of a stupid reaction, because you're building for some reinforce which doesn't exist in 1939. And this is the problem. The German submarine force in 1939 it's very much the nascent force in 1940 it's getting stronger it's 1941 it gets really problematic i see when is the new armchair animals episode release it was done on twitch last night um the new bilge pumps one is edited it wouldn't upload over the wi-fi from the travel lodge last night so it's um it's going to be uploaded after I've done this live. So, if Mitchell's bombing exhibition in the 20s were taken more seriously, would the Malta class of cruisers be more prevalent in the Second World War? Um, the trouble was the way Mitchell ran the demonstrations and exhibitions in the 20s made them be taken less than seriously. Because in the nicest way, even during World War II, for you to get a hit with a bomb at the bare range, he was talking about with a ship which was you know, a ship which was open and uncrewed and not maneuvering, was a very lucky target to get. Sadly. There is there is a point at which there are some serious people around who should have probably been listened to more. But there's also the fact that, and this is always the difficult one to get, we know how aircraft turn out towards the end of World War II. But if you look at the aircraft in the 1920s and 1930s, they don't exactly look like they're going to, at the beginning of the 1920s, they don't exactly look like they're going to become that. It's really not developed much. You can say it's due to budgetary reasons. You can say it's due to just groundswell of infrastructure and technology. But aircraft... The curve of development of aircraft in the 1920s and 30s is very much... It's not reaching that part of the curve and certainly not anywhere near that. Not that we're anywhere near really that to this day, but you know. And I say, and you solve the finance and manpower problem how? Because money is a limiting factor. For which? For the aircraft carriers in 1939, when Churchill makes a decision, you've gone to war and you're in total war form already. In the nicest way, you are already recruiting. And you're already spending all that money. 
there isn't re- it, it, at 1939 you don't have the manpower and the finance and the limitation as yet um those come about as the war goes on but you are still building up the personnel and crew and to be fair you have options because you can always uh, the thing is as was said at certain points, the Royal Indian Navy and the Royal South African Navy were not really as utilised as they well as they could be in terms of personnel generation in World War Two. There is a really big problem in terms of their personnel and the utilisation of them. And frankly, that would have solved some of the manpower issues, especially in the small vessels. Uh, but, you know, the aircraft carriers... Actually, there is this thing that actually having those aircraft carriers coming online might have been a saving factor because there is another second order effect. So if you have aircraft carriers coming online, you start building up air groups and you start building up the uh, the personnel for them as they're being built. So you take people, start taking people from your experienced carriers earlier. So instead of you having quite such high concentrations on courageous and glorious when they go down, those crews would have been diluted, which would mean they wouldn't be such a massive loss of experience when they're lost versus you know, uh, you know, in the versus the reality, if they're still lost. I think that what probably was what you was. Um, Michael Rich, the Royal Navy and Coastal Command had worked up work, had a worked up working arrangement. The cruise marine Luftwaffe didn't. So one change would be for the cruise marine le- Luftwaffe to learn to play nice rather than do their own thing. To be fair, Coastal Command and the RN's arrangement was created with singularly lacking much involvement from the actual Air Ministry, on the advice of the senior Coastal Command officer in the Air Ministry, because every time they started to get involved, in his words, the political elements in the Air Ministry got involved and caused trouble. It's one of the interesting things of World War II that a lot of the cooperation forces of the Royal Air Force, and even Bomber Command and Fighter Command, managed to work best when the what I would call the Air Force Uber All Club are not involved, and there is this strange, weird batch. And the in the in the Air Ministry, I, the Admiralty and the War Office have their own batches as well, but they never allow them to in the that period to get quite so loud. And yeah. On reflection, I wonder if building yards in India capable of building subs and escorts near resources and outside bombing range would have been a sensible se- a seeming idea then. Definitely for the escorts. Uh, the subs, building subs is still quite a technological process at that time. It's it's going to sound strange. It's not just training the people, it's setting up the infrastructure to support them. So yes, it would be a good idea to build yards which could build escorts and subs, but the submarines would take longer to get to than the escorts would. And you could have started churning out flag class corvettes quite easily in, in the RS, but I, I really do believe. Hunt class escort destroyers probably as well. Especially if you'd set up some facility to build the necessary turbines out there. Matt Dill, if the United States had learned that the jets uh, that the jets had eighteen inch gu- uh, Japanese had eighteen inch guns on the Yamato when they put the eighteen uh, would they would they have put the eighteen inch guns on the Yamato Iowas? Probably not on the Iowas, but you might have seen a South Dakota get built. Oh, I think it's the South Dakotas. You might have seen one of the big. Is it Montana's? It's the Montana's. Montana's. You'd have seen Montana get built. I'm fairly certain if the Americans had learnt that there was an eighteen inch armed battleship going around to somewhere, they would have wanted their own massive block of. Basically, steel floating as float uh, with engines and the guns attached in the water just in case. So, I think the interesting thing about the 18 inch Yamatos is not that they would have produced American 18 inch guns, it's that there would have been a Montana class in the water, and that is something I would have liked to have seen personally. Hi, Frank Spano. Yeah, it's the trouble is that Mitchell is very good at self promotion. He's not very necessarily very good at realizing what that promotion means, and it's it's one of the problems about him because I, I actually like him as a person. He's quite funny. He's quite an interesting character, but he 
manages to there's a level at which he could do the stuff and he could make a big splash and make the point he wanted but he always seems to push it just that tad too far he doesn't seem to know where the line is pretty sure the car is Yorktown oh, I'm going to have to click back aren't I so I'm on 1939 Major Axis Navies. Let's click back. Bum, bum. Yeah, that's Yorktown. Well, Yorktown class. That might... Yeah, that is Yorktown class. And immediately it goes to high CPU usage. I don't know. Immediately. And so, unfortunately, this hotel does not stock iron brew. It's terrible. Right, Cash, could we have given an old battlecruiser or battleship to the Canadian Navy or South African Navy, or were they too worn out or unable to maintain their shipyards? Um, the Canadians probably could. The South Africans, I doubt they had. They didn't have the dry docking facility. Canadians could have built the infrastructure facilities, so we could have given them something if we wanted to. Subtle. I suggest Admiral Henderson on Simon's bi uh, biographics page. I'm hoping to see to uh, see him do it. I think he's the only one who can play as passionate about him as you. <laughs> Simon is cool. Simon is um, yeah. Nice to see everyone. Uh, one of his changes: whack the camera to the head with a sandy stick and point out everyone is cheating and treaties. So we, why don't we do the same and get something good? That is another option. Start cheating ourselves. But to be fair, we the thing is we'd written the treaty so we could cheat. Um, I think personally, myself, we should have cheated slightly more with Nelson and Romney, but we'll leave that one side. Edroy, Montana class with a follow on, too big for the Panama Canal. Yes and no. Yes, too big for the Panama, but honestly, if you are dealing with an 18 inch. Um, enemy battleship you build that thing to back up uh, to back yourself up and that would get in the water and i'm happy donald don't are we talking 12 18 or 9 18 9 18 i think that was what the uh, yamata had um if i remember correctly the um montana was 12 16 Good luck, Stafford. Drive safe. Hi to Kentucky, Matt Dill. Hello, Richards. Jojun, you mean you didn't bring an emergency stash? No, where I'm going has a lot of iron brew, so I didn't need to. Where I'm going has a lot of family, so I didn't need to. <laughs> There's a lot of iron brew already there. Sarah Thompson, speaking of infrastructure, were you able to watch some Texas make your way into Dry Dog yesterday? She's in very rough shape, by the looks of things. Yep. She is in rough shape, but she'll be okay. I have confidence she's in the right place and they'll look after her now. And I'm I, I, I was having an interesting conversation with a friend who is Texan right now, and judging by their reaction. They are very Texan. Um, <clears throat> if the, the the funds will be found for whatever she needs, um, there are a fair number of people who seem to be historically minded in Texas and who are slightly upset that the ship that bears their name uh, has be not been properly supported. Sometimes does uh, I sometimes do think Texas is sort of the um, Ultramar of America. Uh, but we'll leave that to one side. Then, right, Nelson and Rodney really were the worst of the compromised battleship designs in the interwar. Um. No, Nelson and Rodney were not the worst of the compromised battleship designs of the Indian War. They were possibly some of the best armoured ships, and they had very good guns. Okay, a light sixteen light shell does get a lot of pro into a lot of 
um, interesting conversations, but by World War II, you look at the damage those ships do, they're pretty darn up there. However, the problem is they are not designed with enough speed, and they limit them to 33,500 tons. I still think on the extra 1,500 tons they had as an allowance in terms of standard, they could probably, and if they possibly fudged that a little bit, could certainly have got them up a few knots faster, and I think it would have been... Um, I think if they had gone to 25 knots, people would be talking about them with very different perspective than they are now. If you've gone to 28 knots, then I think we'd be talking about them as the first fast, uh, the first fast battleships, and we possibly have been seeing a very different perspective on them. So it's it's one of those scenarios that it's a woulda, shoulda, coulda. And I wish they had. They weren't at that slow. Considering how far certain captains got <laughs> Rodney up to, especially, um, I'm not sure we can critique them as being that slow. They're not fast enough. Uh, Nizer now almost had a very nasty run-in with Rodney. But it's... The other thing you have to remember is this. They are... A... By the time World War II begins, they are uh, over, well over a decade into their service lives. They're, nearly, they're approaching nearly two decades of sort of hull life, etc., in certain scenarios. And it's just... These ships are not new ships. Nelson Rodney are not new when World War II happens. That's the thing that's often forgotten. They are the first battleships and the only battleships built in their period, really. But they are old tech, to an extent, by the time you actually get to World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, too. How much difference would Bomber Command giving up its Sterlings to Coastal Command in mid 1940s make? Mm, they'd have been moderate. Uh, they'd have been pretty darn helpful. Would it have made a massive difference? We will never really know. It's one of those operational things. It depends how they're used. Alan Scorf. Um, I think it is roughly 1940. I don't when the U.S. passed the Two Ocean Navy Act. Lauren Cash, did you find the cause of, no uh, cause of Nurgle's plague in your garden? Not yet. I have suspicions, but not yet proof. As Ryan has said, putting a battleship in concrete is bad. Am I right it's too late for Mikasa's underwater hull? Yes. It's well, uh, very much too late. They're asking. They'll place her in Galveston if uh, uh, some pl else place where traffic uh, will be higher, so the museum can sustain it more from ticket sales. That would definitely be lovely if they could. Uh, right, so Dr. C, have you got to see? I got to see the wreck site for the U.S. Lexington. Not yet. Right, right up until now, traffic was circa thirty thousand visitors a year. It needs at least three times more. Honestly, it does, and let's be honest, so, uh, it, it should be a lot more. That's right, even at 25, though, it's too slow for combined fleet actions. Mm, considering they were getting to 25 knots roughly on the spit on the engines they did have, it seems to be getting, um, it seems to be certain officers, uh, captains did get the ships in World War II up to roughly 25 knots when they pushed everything all out. Um, I think they could have gone for a 28 knot design with the 1,500 tons, but it does depend on how you deploy that 1,500 tons and maybe do a little bit of rearranging of the armor and the <clears throat> the guns a little bit. But it's it's one of those things. I think a 28 knot Nelson Romney would have been a very scary thing. I think 23 knot Nelson Romney were not, not a bad design. They just weren't as good as they could be, and that's the annoying thing. Uh, 
Afa, if you fix all the fl uh, all the fleets, don't you fix none? As suddenly everyone has new problems caused by their friends being fixed. It does suddenly make life interesting if you fix all the problems in the fleets. It creates new problems, which is more fun. Everything will have second on first, uh, first and second and third order effects, and probably fourth and fifth, but they're even uh, more difficult to discern. Come on, Cameron. Speaking of Nelson, if the Japanese had not known about our torpedoes, would the long lance design have been smaller? No, it needs to be a certain size to actually work. So 24 inches is probably what they're going for. Run cash. Everyone is gangster and throws shade on their odds until they get in a fight with them. Yeah, that is the trouble. Is Once you're in a fight with them, then you're in trouble. Then you're in trouble. Frank Swanner. Are Nelson dreadnoughts or treat battleships? Or something else. They're treaty battleships. They're first treaty battleships. They're London treaty. They're Washington treaty battleships. Most of the other battleships are London treaty battleships. Nice second. How did Macassia avoid getting bombed bombed by the US Air Force B twenty nines? I think they did actually hit near nearly hit her. Frank Swanner. Don't see which classes of battleships had a clear chance of beating the Nelsons. Um. The Latorios probably had a chance, depending on their quality of their ammunition. Iowa's had a chance, and Yamoto, and Masashi, of course. But honestly, you're dealing with the things which are the closest to what the British were looking at for the N3s that was built, in that whilst they do have all-or-nothing armour, the space they have armoured is sufficiently armoured that at most engagement ranges you are not going to defect the buoyancy of that hull and therefore it's going to keep firing until it runs out of ammunition. Your advantages are going to be to try and dart around it and the trouble is as long as it's got able to fire it's got a chance of hitting you as well. So your whole advantage in those cases is usually a speed advantage not an armor advantage, which means you've got to be very, you've got to dance around it. Um, there aren't many 15 inch ships I would like to take up against it, and definitely none of the 14 inch ships would I like to take up against an Elrod. Um, MC Legend 13 inch. Hello, Nature 11. I would argue 25 knots isn't the best, but lots of good ovens. So it was made by 25 knot ships. Ghost of Pisa, the Queen of Machine Spirits. Yeah, 28 knots is what you need them to do, but 25 would have been okay, okay because if we consider if they were aiming for 23, could do 25. If they're aiming for 25, and you consider what they pushed up, then they probably get 27, maybe a little bit more. Uh, considering how efficient the hull design turned out to be. And then you probably have a sunk Nizer now earlier in the war, because they didn't start pulling ahead and, and actually getting space between them and Rodney till they were going 26 knots. So that tells you how fast Rodney was going. Admittedly, Nizer now was caught pretty much dead stop for a battleship. It was doing about, I think, 10 or so knots. So that's pretty much panic mode when they see a batter, they see Rodney coming over the horizon. But if Rodney had been going a little bit faster, they'd have never got out of range. And at that point, they would probably have been in a lot of trouble because those 16-inch guns would have made quick, uh, quick work of what was a 11-inch armed battleship. Because let's be honest, the Shan Horse were battleships. They just were the battle best ships, to the best battleships that the Kree, uh, that the um, Kriegsmarine could actually build at the time because of their maritime infrastructure. So anyway, if the current treaties got uh, US get sent back in time to where treaty where treaty matters, 
How fast are warships nowadays? I read on Wikipedia that some German frigates only three knots, and that made me question the veracity of that. It wouldn't surprise me. You have to remember, a lot of ships these days are designed by accountants rather than engineers. Um, that was my dad's used to joke about it. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's the, the problem is if you're going above 30 knots then it's very expensive and it takes up a lot of hull volume and you only really need to start looking at operating in that sort of regions if you're thinking about operating with a carrier battle group or a task force if that's going to be in the front line of any engagement things which are further back can probably go a bit slower and you can save a lot of money and a lot of hull volume for other things. So it's it's a it's a constant challenge. So anyway, I still want the US to somehow explain their current museum ship fleet to other treaty powers. It would cause a panic attack amongst many, many in the nicest way, if you want to see the King George I get cancelled, or or have all their designs migrated into some version of the little lions with sixteen inch guns. Um, yeah, that would be a quick way to see that happen. Thanks, Don't see what may have been Nelson's great thing after the speed issue. Uh, the cheese storage? No. Um, in a serious serious thing, their greatest weakness after the speed issue, I would say. To me, in my mind, it's the positioning of B, a B turret. Um, I would have gone with A, 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 B, C rays, as they did on the F3 design. Um, the reason being that that gives you a better field of fire from your guns to an extent. I do realise people that well, you'll start getting upset when you go, I know. It also means you have to have a longer space, especially if you want to have your guns being able to go all the way around at various points. Um, you end up with that scenario. It's, it's going to sound strange. As the scenario they had, you had one gun, another gun, boom, I've got an This one can do the full 360. And uh, this one can cover quite a large chunk, and this one can cover quite a large chunk. So that's how they worked it. Basically, they could both do 270 arcs. Now, if you go with the other scenario, you end up with this one, this one, uh, the forward one can do the 360. The B can do 270, and the C can do 270, and the C is raised up. But you can also, at this point, therefore, fire all nine forward, which I think is an advantage. I can understand why they didn't. I can understand what their logic was. I disagree with that. But that's an argument over preferences rather than an argument of right or wrong. And to an extent, minds with some hindsight and thinking of that nice now engagement. All right, Cash, I'm not sure if this is too difficult to answer, but could a fast watch No, they couldn't. If you think about it, to stay on her stern and do that scenario, they'd have had to be so close it's beyond belief. At any ranges which a battleship would normally engage in, there is no way you're sticking in the blind spot of an else on an ordinary. Material. Should the refit Queen Elizabeth be with the group class as fast battleships or super dreadnoughts? Even the super dreadnoughts, that's what they were. GDM, but speaking of dockyards, what's with the current Prince of Wales going to a foreign dockyard for repairs? It's in Bilge Pumps. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's in Bilge Pumps. That's discussed in Bilge Pumps, which might come out later this evening and might come out tomorrow morning. In fact, were the air forces fixed faster and thus more of a threat simply because the short life cycle speeds of aircraft weapons? And was it thus a, lot, a losing proposition? Was it always a losing stuff that proposition for the service air forces? Um, not really. It's going to sound strange, but air forces were fixed, aren't really fixed faster. 
they often people start looking at the funding and go, well, you know, the Air Force are now the priority because they're getting more money. But the Air Forces have to build up infrastructure. For the armies and navies, most of them are just having to reactivate infrastructure, which tends to be cheaper than building it from scratch. Now, the big problem for surface naval forces was actually getting gun mounts, which would do the right level of uh, the right level of um, anti-aircraft firepower. There had been a big debate over how aircraft would attack ships. You have to remember, in Britain, the Air Ministry had put forward consistently the idea that it would be no dive bombing. It would be level bombing from heavy bombers or torpedo attacks. And level bombing, from uh, that, that was the consistent thing. Da, 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 da. Navy wasn't quite sure about this, but the Air Ministry were the experts, and so this factors into a lot of development of guns and gun mounts, especially in the 1920s and the 1930s. This is despite the fact that at several points, the RAF being the world's best dive bombing force, thanks to their various heart bombers. Um, the heart light bombers. Uh, they're very good aircraft. We'll leave that to one side, though. Dr. C, how well did the Nelson do against bunkers and did they ever destroy a train? Not sure about a train, but bunkers, well, there are a fair number of um, large holes in Normandy. So, anyway, if the US tell the other tree pads, yes, we got four 50,000 ton battleships, then we're using their museums, also, we got three other museum battleships. Yeah, then the then, in the nicest way, the Royal Navy's probably turning around and finding a 60,000 ton design. And that's goodness knows what other powers do. Frank Spoiler, did Eric Brown ever serve on a battleship? I don't think he did. Seneca, Dr. Dr. AC looks too much like Drac. It does. We do have fun, but you there are many people who think they've met him and have actually met me, and people who think they've met me and have actually met him. He and I still have, have a lot of fun with this one. And there was a good few years where there were actually articles out there which said I was a Drac. And that was a funny that was a funny thing. Then right, when the Americans struck Libya, the carrier had to sprint across the Med from Italy, and the only ship to keep up with her was the um, cruiser North Carolina. That movement is no longer possible. And that's your problem. Now the only thing that can keep up the carrier is the nuclear-powered submarine. And that's not good for your air defense bubble. Let's see, are there any models of the F3 now on Nelson design that you get and get? Um, not models, but there are plans if you go and look for them. I think I showed I did a video where I showed the plans a while back. MC Legend 38, would the British try to build an 18-inch armed battleship to the when announced? The British did have an 18-inch gun they were sort of always toying with and working with, a legacy of the N3s. And various other vessels. So, yeah, the British might produce an 18 inch gun arm battleship. You might see some sort of one off ship, kind of like Vanguard like. But the odds are it's going to be a 16 inch vessel. Dead Row, I was amazed, in Scotland four years ago, and I was amazed how little shipyards were left on the fight. It is quite sad. How about this? Dido vs. Atlanta is large A destroyer type. Um, here's where I get into trouble. I prefer, as a rule, the Atlanta over the Dido. And that's because, although I'm not the biggest fan of Eva, because, this, to be honest, my thinking with the Atlanta is because, whilst they are an A destroyer light cruiser, uh, sort of a cruiser, light cruiser, they use the destroy them. The fact is they use the interchangeable destroyer weapon, and I like that. And this assisted with the development of destroyer guns. 
whereas the British used the 5.25 on the Dido's, which just complicated logistics. And that is the point. The British managed to make a massive overcomplication of logistics during World War II. Um, 5.25 is good, but they've got the 5.25, the 4.7, the 4.5, all going around at the same time, and the 4-inch, and you sit there and go, just standardize on one type, please. Why didn't you just standardize on one type? I don't care what you standardize on. But it would have been so much better if you'd standardized on a single type and just made your lives a lot easier. I say a free one. How do you get Chatfield to abandon the 14 inch gun? <sighs> no idea. Fire him. I think IO2 is right, has the right idea. Uh, honestly, Chatfield is obsessed with rate of fire. That's his thing. He's obsessed with rate of fire. And there is part of me which thinks if he had been successful in getting a 12, 14 inch gun battleship, then, and those quadruple turrets had worked, then there is an argument for it. But there again, there's an also an argument for Diet Coke. But I never listened to it because, frankly, there, there is real Coke available. RG, Dr. Clark, what if some weird circumstance the design team for North Carolina is go full fisher and make a 16 inch triple turret version of Dido class? What happens? Um, well, it depends. If they actually build it, then someone has a panic attack. Probably multiple people have panic attacks. In many, many countries. Obviously, if a Nelson got torpedoed in a similar way like Bismarck, but it's just South Italy, could the Raider Marina try to hunt her like the Bismarck? They could try and hunt her like the Bismarck. The experience would not be the same as hunting the Bismarck. It would be probably very traumatic. And remember, some, some of the, the Nelsons were injured at various points in the Mediterranean campaign. The British were very practiced at removing damaged ships under fire. They lost a few destroyers doing it, they didn't always manage to get them out, but the larger capital ships they were fairly decent at. Um, so expected to have turned into another battle, which might have ended up being actually to the British advantage. Also, there's the fact that if you manage to do that to an Elrod, you have been very, very lucky. Dead right, really? I would have thought the high velocity 5.25 was much superior than the 5 inch. Overall, as said, the reason I like the Atlantis is because whilst the 5.25 inch is superior to an air on paper, I would say logistically as a whole force, I prefer the 5 inch. I prefer the idea of going for a universal gun and supplying it and sustaining it. I think logistically that makes sense. I think so that makes sense logically. I think the British again have shot a shoot themselves in the foot with that one. Hey Wayne. Hey Wayne. The only thing better than perfect is standardized. Logistically, yes, because quantity has a quality all of its own. And 10 10 90% solutions that are 90% across the board tend to work provide you a lot better force for generation than three sets of 100%. And that's usually what it works out as. Ron Cash, there must have been some pros and cons of the 4.5 and 4.7. What's the, the, what the difference? Uh, the 4.5 was a newer gun, and it was able to get to a higher angle more easily. And they could therefore have a, greater, have a higher caliber, so it could be have more... So it could be accurate to the longer range. So there are advantages to a 4.5 over 4.7. I'm very happy with a 4.5. That's the point. I think 5 inches is, is the best one for the Americans, but if I'd been the British in the scenario with the 4.5 
4.7, 4 inch, and 5.25, my cruisers would probably have had 4.5 inch guns. And honestly, if I had done that with the C with the Dido's, and I had built that 4.5 inch dual mount, and I'd managed to get that working for the Dido's, I'd probably got it working for the destroyers as well. Which means I'd have probably put it fitted onto the C class and D class cruisers as well. So all of them would have had 4.5s, which would have been the standardization across the force, and that would have been a very useful thing. Okay, yes, the 4.5 individually, you can trade off against the 5 inch. There's fours and against, and they're both, uh, they're both in operation. But in nice way, that volume of 4.5 inch bar for the British would have been very, very useful and very useful to have standardized. And it would have made logistics for the Far East, for the Mediterranean, for the North Atlantic that much easier. Appa, why did the UK keep lots of 30 half inch guns for use in, or didn't the UK keep lots of 30 half inch guns for use in cruiser killer or even monitors? Um, mainly just because they just didn't. They didn't think about it. Uh, for instance, let's see. Is the story, uh, the story of how the US snuck a 40mm out of Sweden is true, but didn't happen? Would the US just mass produce the pom pom? More than likely. Nothing's worth 16 inch guns, I think. Um, but had Chatfield forgotten how fatal rate of fire had been in World War One for the RN? Uh, look, there's, there, there is one thing you realize about BT and his acolytes. They, once they got an idea firmly fixed in their brain, they were never going to get a drop it. Um, Liberate. If the 14 inch is staying on the King Godfrey V, then how do you convince the Navy to fudge the numbers of tonnage and keep the free quad turrets? How much did they save dropping in the twin? Surely it was close enough. Um, I think that would have been an interesting thing to have got, got the free quad turrets. I think it wouldn't have say. Honestly, it doesn't save that much weight, but they right on the edge of waiting anyway. So the Royal Navy would have had to lie quite dramatically. Wait, what? How many 18 inch 45 guns could you fit in a King George V? Um, well, the standard rule is you drop one for each one you go up. So, for two inches, if you drop, for, if you had put a design over three quadruples and you decide to put the 16, you could have probably put nine 16 inch guns. If you do go for 18, you can probably put six in three twin turrets. <sighs> Michael Coach, okay, accepting Chatfield's wrong about the 14 inch, what decisions have been right about that made the difference? Well, this is the interesting thing. You have to remember the deal he made with Henderson, which was basically he gave over the rights of all other ship design to Henderson in order to get his 14 inch guns for the King George V. So he makes right the decision. He's basically, he hands over control of procurement for the Royal Navy to his third Seaboard. Otherwise, he was facing various problems. And he then immediately starts quashing that story post World War Two because Henderson's dead and he can start he can put around a different story. Right, so just say you said very lucky about hitting Nelson. Do you mean they have special torpedo protection runner? Shape of the hull it makes actually getting a hit on the rudder more difficult on a nil rod. Um, the way the water flows around it. It was a study I read a couple of years ago by someone who was a very obsessed with naval architect. Interesting guy, though. Re senior research assistant on it. The, the, the lead author on it was a professor who wasn't actually involved in Sometimes it's interesting. Professors actually do take part in the research. But he and his PhD student who was... Oh, I'm trying to remember her name. I think she now works for the Japanese Navy. Um, I think. But um, they, specialized, they did a whole study on it. It was kind of interesting to read. And look, the industrialization of the US and the UK is very sad. Look at wiki page for Fletcher class. It doesn't shipyards and Bath is the only one that says like this. Um, the very fun. If I remember right, he did increase the number of crews and car carries the iron one they wanted. Uh, no, ascension. <laughs> he gave all other decisions to Henderson. That included those. <laughs> 
basically to get his 14 inch guns he had to give the rights of the keys of the kingdom away to his third sea lord Abfab, how big does a shell get before it's too big to handle many on it? Yeah, especially for a use. Five inches about the limit. 5.25 you can sort of get away with. But you're getting... Uh, there's, a, there's a level at which it's manual versus manual versus... Really, this is manual loader. They're just mach I'm just manually controlling all the machines that do it. This is, this is machine loaded. Um, it, there, there are those levels, different levels of manual. So um, it's up to five inches manual, as in hmm, hmm. anything bigger than that starts to get assistance of some level. I see. Uh, maybe swap the 5.25s for 4.5s, uh, save weight in the secondaries, and fudge the weight of their A battery, and then be really surprised when you can quadruple the A battery without issues. How big, uh, and fab, how big does a shell get before it's uh, on some one? It's under five. Doctor C, if they are in some nice to four and a half inch, could flowers cope with it? Um, yeah. mm, swans could have. Um, flowers were mostly fitted with single four-inch guns left over from Model 1, so it really wouldn't have affected them. Um, there is a difference. <sighs> they mostly get what's left over from Model 1, so they don't really need to worry about. But if you've gone... The castles probably could have taken the 4.5 under that scenario. I'm still after hearing the MO2 was announced, the British aren't able to make an 18 inch battleship, but since the MO2 is 9 18 inch guns, would they go for a Montana route and have a guns 12 16 inch guns? They could do that. They could go 12 16 inch guns. Some bright spot might try even quadruple turrets and go for 16 16 inch guns. There's always that. A bright spot might go, well, hang on, 12 16 inch guns is the same, but 16. Imagine the rate of fire. And now, after doing all this stuff with 14-inch guns, we know how to make a quad turret. It would have been interesting. Uh, so, uh, okay. I uh, see. For wrapping a handle fire, five inch thirty eight is about perfect. Much bigger and becomes too heavy to handle. Mm. I say different. So the narrow rods with twelve five point two five inch and four and a half inches secondary about affect things in model two. Um, always go for the four and a half. Nelson's were six. And Liam's through. Nelson's were sixteen inch guns. Yes, they were. RG. Reef Fisher, Dido, North Carolina. Assuming built in in service. Has it performed Model 2? What the what would be the response from our powers? Uh, <coughs> the other powers would be panicking and building their own equivalents. As for its service in World War II, well, that thing might be enough to scare even the goodness knows what the Japanese build as their battleship response to it. Goodness knows what they build. For instance, what is the better anti amateur plan? Use the same number of 18 inch guns or the greater number of 16 inch guns? A greater number of 18 inch guns is probably the best plan, but more than like a 16 inch has a probably better rate of fire, so 16 inch. Run cash. Would four and a half inch four point seven have been okay for the battleship secondaries, or were secondaries already a bit surplus so nearing mid and bearing in mind escorts? No, four point fives was fine for the secondaries because let's be honest, what does the battleship use the secondaries for? To engage destroyers and things below that level. Uh, if they're in, if they're engaging cruisers, then 
a cruiser will probably get a more something from the main battery just to say goodbye to it in one go. You agreeing with me or disagreeing with me? You agreeing with me? Okay. Ah. Uh, <laughs> comes Ron AV Cup fleets with some 9.2 inch true heavy cruiser in 37 39. How does this affect the war and how do I respond to this? Well, the US probably accelerates the Alaska class program. Um, the Kriegsmarine probably has a panic attack about what's going to happen to their Deutschlands. The Japanese might actually accelerate their own heavy cruiser program. But honestly, the main thing is the Royal Navy ends up probably with those cruisers being part of the forces which are the fast fleet. So a 9.2 inch gunned heavy cruiser, especially as the British probably go with nine 9.2 inch guns in three triple mounts. Um, some sort of uh, renowned repulse layout sort of scenario um, would probably have seriously impacted upon some navies' calculations for their smaller, their older ships. Uh, GD Hum, why didn't King George V go high pressure steam to say no to America? Is it because you'd have had to change everything to high pressure steam? It, the, the point is, the British are building boilers at that time and they get they've got them going and you if you want to go for high pressure steam that would be lovely and that's what the British would like to do but then you'd have to change everything to support high pressure steam you know what you're doing at the moment there's a pace is your industry already set up your infrastructure already set up to support that's to turn out the people to train the people you would have to restart a lot of things to transition that so it's honestly it's a thing of we can go with the best version of the thing we already do, or we can go with a new uh, new mm. thing. And going with a new thing is going to delay us. What are you complaining about? Have you used up all your water? No? Okay, just complaining because it's... Is it cold in here? Do you not like where your bed is? I thought you like it there. You have used up all your water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just feel like company. Okay. Sorry, floppy research assistant. Chatting away. You're a good boy. And um, yeah, there's reliability of plant, but yes. Nice agreement. Should Henderson have authorized a 15 inch 45 caliber gun? Half the agreement. And there's only money to deal with one battleship gun. But it would have been good to have had it. Can you ever you ever go over that Nelson design study again? Never heard that before. Um, I'll go over the G3. I did it during the G3's uh, video, but I'll I'll do another one about them at some point. Come here. Come on. Come, Bubba. Hello. What's up? Hello. What's up? You okay? All right. All right. What's wrong? What's wrong? You want to turn off the air conditioning? Are you cold? Are you cold? Is that literally what you're complaining about? I'll turn off the aircon. How's that sound? Yeah. Oh, you oh. Fluffy research assistants. Um. <sighs> Point what? I keep thinking of Furious 18 inch guns. I'm wondering how it could be used in Model 2. Monitor? That's probably best for them. Monitor is probably best. Oh, you good. Oh. Hmm. Hello, you. Hi, Columba. Um, Danny Phillips. The Germans panic as their new hippers are suddenly hideously outgunned. I mean, Adrian is probably not happy as either does the them. Yeah, it causes all sorts of fun. Um, Ted Roy, a very handsome ship, the castles. Mm. MC Legend, 16 16 inch guns. That would be a King George VIP on steroids. Yeah. Wait, well, how about 16 18 inch 45 guns? If you built that, that would probably scare the bejesus out of even the Soviet Union. Um, because that would have enough firepower to probably blast its way through the Soviet Union. 
who would go, well, the British have built their first battleship, which can actually carve its own path to Moscow. Build a canal as it goes. Boom. Oh, did we just clear enough soil we can flow through? Um, is there a practical limit to the number of barrels per turret? Collision of flight. Um, I honestly do not like the idea of a quintuple or a sextuple turret, but quadruple is, uh, oh, is practical. There is the practical limit and there is the actual limit. The, there is, the, theoretically, you can get away with as many as you like. Practically, it's a lot easier to be less than that. Um, and Fab, at what point in the Calibre race does someone go, hang on, instead we could, e.g. to degree the Japanese long lance for the aircraft carrying general? Or what's the mindset long then? Um, you have to remember there's always a legacy bias in that this is the technology we know works. So we're pursuing the best version of the technology we know works whilst also pursuing the new technology. And that's what navies will often do. They'll often do both things at once because that's what they have to do. They have to pursue the new technology because that could be the new future, the best technology. But until they are certain about that, they also have to assume and pursue the best of the legacy tech because if they don't and the new technology fails, then they've let everything down. So you always have to have the insurance. The best legacy, the best of the legacy uh, version is probably your insurance model. Hmm. Um, nice thing for none. I do feel that like in all Navy upgrade with the intro, good compromises that lets you upgrade all your ships commonality or just build two vanguards. Yep. I do have a fluffy research assistant movie lines. Was it a mistake for the Iron not to pursue heavy cruisers in more construction? Would something like Neptune have been a full investment? Uh, I wouldn't have minded an, a, a, a um, heavy cruiser, but I can understand the arguments for and against. It's something I would have liked, but I can understand why they didn't. In the end, they need to put, them, uh, put the effort into the aircraft carrier program. Then the Velika. Dr. C, if the Tribals had 4.5s, would it increase their rate of fire enough to offset their drop in caliber? Yes. Especially if they had the 4.5 design they'd have been designed with, which would have been a version of what eventually was fitted on the bearings. So if you look at bearings guns and what their rate of fire and capability is, imagine the ship toting four of those. Also imagine its ability to engage aircraft as its gun could go really quite high up. So instead of you having the problem that would later require X mount to be replaced by a four inch gun, between four inch guns, you'd have had that rate of fire and that ability to engage aircraft from the beginning. Ah, RG, Durpitz versus Fisher, Dido, uh, Durpitz versus Fisher, Dido, North Carolina. Um, Dido, North Carolina every time. Yamoto versus Fisher, Dido, North Carolina. Um, who catches who first? Durpitz is a hilariously inefficient design. Uh... Uh, I mean, during the war, the 30s, I know that more light cruisers, Leanders, I refuse, and towns make sense. They do, but have some having heavy cruisers would have been good. Hmm. I've heard pets at home dog harness. Yeah. It's a good one. We got one for both dogs with the wandering were that round going on these next couple of weeks, it seems sensible. Nice to get everyone, you're correct. Time is Britain's biggest enemy. My time reckons, it's the mid-30s, you're the Royal Navy, and you know that the treaty system won't mean squad in a few years. Someone gives you a vanguard specs and basic layout and hull design. Provide you convince you and then peace can't be done. Yes. Very fun to see. Would the talk rooms on Nelson liability? Yes. Tremendously so.
Uh, so I don't know, what do you think Benjamin Tillman would think of the, about the fact that the thing his name is most associated now is big battleships? He would probably be crying, and it's probably if anyone could hook a generator up to his um, coffin, it would probably be it's probably spinning enough to generate electricity at this point. And I do not mean that in a sacrilegious sense. I mean that in a pure fury sense because he was really anti the big battleships. He thought them a massive waste of money. Jordan, wouldn't the Decker turret cause the ship's center of gravity to change too drastically as the turret rotates? How big would the ship have to be for a Decker turret? That's the question. How big? And is it a Decker turret five double stacked guns? I. What was it? There was a there was a tank that was um, was it the mammoth tank in Red Alert which had double stacked tank guns? I know it had two guns, but were they double stacked? That's a good one. Why can't people get it for their heads? The UK has to throw whatever it gets its hand or shot notice at the freaking front line of the war. Often because people presume that Britain has two years similar to America, but they believe they starts in nineteen thirty seven. And the trouble is the government in nineteen thirty seven does not believe there's war gonna be war in nineteen thirty nine. They believe it's nineteen forty two. Uh Excellent. Let's see. The Vian's tribals are given a company of Gurkhas while fighting Bismarck. How long until it's captured? Oh, good lord. If you put a, managed to put a company of Gurkhas aboard Bismarck in the middle of that night. Um... Okay, so they do box Bismarck in. So theoretically, what they could do is get in front of the Bismarck and deploy the, Gur the Gurkhas by boats. Um, if they had that many borders and that sort of border boarding team, the Bismarck's going to be moving quickly, though. So they would need to have some system of making sure the boats all came alongside. So you probably want to string them out with a very, very strong rope and then hope that the motion of the ship itself would bring them alongside and then have them all jump up somehow. But then you've got a very interesting fight on your hands to gain a ship. It wouldn't be exactly easy or quick or, qu or necessarily quick enough, but... There again, Gurkhas at night are notoriously not good to fight. <sighs> Presumably they'd be combined with some Royal Marines and Royal Navy sailors so they know their way around a ship, but again it would be navigating around a foreign ship in the dark while fighting. Because the Germans would presumably realise something was going on at some point. Although they might think the bangs of the boats against the hull were torpedoes hitting it not going off. Mm. Lions, I would love to see an Alaska with 12 12 inch guns in four triples. That's building a battleship at that point. What else, world? Curious, Alex. Have you, if folks, had any luck in your research on Arjun Court that was cancelled by Churchill? Uh, me and Drac are continuing our research, and it's kind of interesting. When we find out more, we'll do something interesting. Epap, is it ironic that the last UK battleship is the Uber Queen Elizabeth? Hmm. Yeah, to an extent. Gene Hammond, Norman Freeman just published an article on double turrets and the old US battleships in the US History Magazine, which can be read free at the US Naval Institute site. Cool. Hi, Papaxi. There was an underground locomotive called a Decapod. Cool. Phone camera. Are you talking about a flak verling mount for battleship main guns? No. Although that would be an interesting one. Uh, camera. Russia had a prototype of an under and over twin 152mm that abandoned it for the Kolista uh, uh, self propelled artillery, but that is about the only over and under I know of. Except stuff like the 40mm Bofors or pom poms. 
Hmm. Alec, how much of the UK's annual steam production would be needed to build a ship large enough to support their guitarists? Um, the modern steel production or the World War pre World War Two steel production. There's a small difference, but it would be a significant amount of it. We probably have raided Czechoslovakia and Sweden as well, and possibly America. I have, I have sadly memories of the USN having to recruit grey-haired people to crew the engineering on the hours because no one had any high pressure steam knowledge outside of the new people. That would not surprise me. So anyway, before World War II, Ireland joins the Axis and the sort of beforehand lets Italian battleships base in Dublin. What happens? Well, y y you've heard about Taranto. Well, let me put it this way. The ships which are in Dublin, when World War II breaks out, not even, this is, there is a scenario called Mezzo Kabir, there's a scenario called uh, Taranto. What probably happens at Mezzo uh, in Dublin is a armoured division of the British Army marches south from Belfast and under that scenario, and the Royal Navy bombs the bejesus out of the harbour while the RAF bombs the bejesus out of um, everything else. Excuse the frigating language. Uh, it, 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 the British would not tolerate Italian battleships sitting in Dublin. No matter that it's, it, Dublin would be a free nation and able to do these things in the 90, scenario of the 1939 war beginning and Axis power behind them, that would be a very quick way for Dublin to find itself facing a very large British invasion. It would be interesting to see what America would react to that with, but there would probably be quite a few people who would be going, well, you don't do that to the British. But it would be interesting to see what happened. Probably make Roosevelt's position slightly more difficult. But Ireland going Axis is very, very unlikely. Very, very unlikely. They're one of the few countries in the world which reliably has a conscience when it comes to their, their, their international relations and actually uses that conscience. Oh, what's the problem? What's up? What do you want? Do you want lap time? Do you want Wanda? Um, I think this has got about another half hour versus of slides. Is that okay? Can we go for Wanda? Is that okay? Or are you disturbed by things going next door? Hmm? Is it next door that's disturbing you? What do you want? Mm -hmm. Everyone, I do apologize. I think my young fluffy research assistant would like me to go to uh, take him to quickly to the loo. I'll be back shortly. I've highlighted where I am in the questions. I do apologize for this. I'll be back shortly. This is the trouble with doing this from a hotel. <sighs> Sorry. He's going to be good at me, Boston.
wash my hands. And then I will get on with talking to you. Uh, you want to race back straight away to tell everyone we're back? That's what I asked you. Okay, you go tell everyone we're back. Come on, you go say hello. You don't even need to say hello. You know, tell other people are happy when you operate. Don't pretend you don't. <sighs> Have you said hello to everyone? No, you've just stood here and gone, Wolf, I'm back. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh. You want a biscuit now, don't you, or something? I don't have any biscuits on me. So sorry, you're not getting anything. You've got your dinner there, though. Hello. Hi. <laughs> you really are looking at me going, I want a biscuit. Do I have... Would you like to lick the ice cream pot? While the poodle gets his reward of licking an ice cream pot, I will reset this back to where it was and go, hello everyone. Right. Uh... <sighs> right, RG, what would have changed for the Kriegsmarine if they had destroyers with proper guns and proper secondary batteries? Um, they need them in enough numbers, but if you had destroyers which had proper secondary batteries, and proper batteries in the first place, they could probably have achieved a few more victories. The thing is, if the Kriegsmarine had actually been able to escort their ships out, they could have been far more successful. Because if you can escort... Let's put it this way. It's not even escorting the um, big battleship out, or the, the cruiser out. If you can set up an escort with that cruiser or that battleship, then you can actually maybe get a couple of them together and actually escort them to make it viable. You can maybe get a supply ship with them and you can make the task force far more difficult. It's always the second or and third order effects of what you actually do that will have the impact. But yes, that's what you're getting instead of a biscuit. You got the ice cream. But now waiting for a... <laughs> They're all in, my ba in the bag in the car. Oh. Mm, do, 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 do. Third right, interesting to build a Gatling main gun. It would have been technologically very interesting. Uh, mm. Yeah, investing in the infrastructure at all would have been sensible. That's okay for him. I too. After the two London Second Treaty does not include the future access, would it be possible to have at least some of the King George hits modified to still can be complete with all complete with all quads? Um, not the, the theoretically for how and Anson and how, but not the others. Theoretically, Anson and how aren't that as far along. Now imagine the King George V with wing turrets. Please don't. If the British bombed up... If... Yeah. Iceland's still not happy about the British taking World War II. No, they're not, but they 
had it happen. One of those things, the British were just not running the risk after Norway, etc. had lost. And let's be honest, Iceland didn't have any military. That was the British justification. It was a case of, well, look what's happened to Norway. Look what the, the next Hail Mary maneuver for the Germans will be Iceland, and we can't afford them to. That would be almost game over for our ability to move supplies across the North Atlantic. We can't afford that. So, and sorry, Iceland, you, yeah. There was very little option the British weren't waiting for. The, the British get very ruthless when they're in the, their backs against the wall. Hmm. Actually, the orange researchers and the assistants are alarmed that another researcher might <laughs> address <laughs> They've gone to consult the ombudsman. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Nine orders. Just a quick question over from while the doctor is away. How important do you think teak deck is for image post war Monday? Post war, it's still very important. Today, I'm not so sure. But as Ted Roy says, nice and end saying, now, Aeon, horrible to maintain. Hmm. Mm. When's good uh, and snow cruises? When's good old build trips coming out? Um, it honestly last night the Wi Fi wouldn't let it load up, so it's probably going to be out either tonight or tomorrow because the Wi Fi here will will let me to load up. Anyway, it's an immunist for the some just donated millions to the municipality for infrastructure projects. I don't like a dude. Sounds like a really sensible person. Hello, Jack Ray. Basically, if you want to make a greener environment, if you want to make a better tomorrow, start by doing the unsexy stuff, the infrastructure. All the other stuff sounds good, looks really cool. But if you don't have the infrastructure in place, it ain't going to deliver diddly squat. Is it? It's not without the infrastructure in place. The main infrastructure you care about is the supply of biscuits, which I will have to go to my car after this is over and I will get new ones because you've already eaten all the ones I brought in earlier with me. Yes, you have. Or a piggy. An Italian fleet sunk in Dublin without its fast, with its fast war ships equals not enough ships to support the invasion of Egypt. Also, pressure on French to hand over their fleet at Armistice. Um, there would have been all sorts of issues under those scenarios. It would have been a very, very complicated world. Mm. Anna, interesting thought about the Wildcat. What did Eric Brown think about the Hellcat? He liked the Hellcat. Um, the Brewster Buffalo, he was less keen on, but there again, he felt the Brewster Buffalo was an aircraft of its time. And it was a perfectly serviceable aircraft. Look at how good the Australians were at using it when they were when they started. They were using it at the beginning in the Singapore campaign. The Brewster Buffaloes did well. You know, it was a squadron of those which were on call to go and help 4C, although 4C didn't realize they were on call. And this is again the whole thing which comes back to having an aircraft carry with you. The Bettys don't have any escorting fighters. If you have a carrier with you, you have the air carrier to break up the initial strikes, but they also make a call and some Brewster Buffaloes turn up, and then you have probably enough fighters to actually drive off the Bettys, and then 4C survives. And if 4C survives, you're in a very different world space, aren't you? Yes, you are. Hello. Oh, good boy. You're being far more active tonight than you were last night. Did armchair animals you not worry about, but this one you want to be, you feel you should be more a part of? Yes, you, you feel you and you should be more of a part of this one. Okay. All right. 
Y la vida. Oh boy. Yeah. Thank you. Next one. Uh, the next, uh, next thump on the poodle. What are you after exactly? There is nothing over here for you. You f Do you think you should lick the plate of meringue? You're not getting meringue. And you're not getting pizza, right? The pizza. No, you're not. I don't know. Poodles, they're so difficult to negotiate with. They want it all. They, they do not understand the concept of an equitable treaty. Fins did really well the buffalo. They did, Enoch. Ted Roy, and the Russians with the air cover. It's all about the tactics and the P-40 in China. Mm -hmm. Doing the, ta the tactics do make a big difference in how you employ aircraft. It's one of the things. When you start comparing aircraft on the metrics of the aircraft, then things like the full mile look really, really bad. Once you compare them on the metrics of how they were used by the British and how the British adapted tactics to make the best use of them, suddenly their scores and their ability to operate starts to look really quite good and suddenly you start to think well hang on maybe these aircraft weren't as outclassed as we'd like to think because the way the british used them made the best use of the capabilities they did have rg let's say it's 1941 and guard the scalper flow have to explain explain how the entire crease marine just snuck into defect um, that would change things. So, what would be a good role for pre generals in World War II? Could they replace regular battleships in shore bombardment duties? To an extent, um, the Greeks have a couple. There are some wandering around. Even, hello. Even in World War II. And... Hmm... Uh, and they do get used to things like Shulman Band and, of course, port defence. They are good for coastal defence. Mm. What do you want? You can't want... You've just been out, so that's not that. What are you asking for? Sit down for a bit and we'll go out in a second. Um, <laughs> oh. The P40 did quite well in North Africa too, even against. No, Raleigh. No. There's nothing for you to have. You've just been out. Stop it. Sorry, this is a trouble. He spends the whole day with me and he gets what he wants the whole time because his path is a bit of a pushover. And then when it's a case of I can't give him exactly what he wants and what he wants is probably a game at the moment, um, he goes a bit stroppy. And he's good company. Uh, let's move the chair a bit. So... Hit the top of mad, that might ca even cause him to die from aneurysm. Uh, if the, well, if you've got the whole of the um, Kriegsmarine trying to get themselves interned, yes. I too, the Iron Confused, but happy to have more ships and less enemy ships to counter, yes. Even the F4Fs were outclassed with zeros, but the tactics they adopted made them better, and also the fact that the F4Fs could seriously dish out the punishment. And that's the thing. The Zero had to be lucky every time. The F4F only had to be lucky once. And that's the difference when you design a, when you design an aircraft. If you make an aircraft that is built around, let's say, its capability to be very fast and light and very maneuverable, it has to manage to be in a scenario where its, its speed and maneuverability allows it to get the kill every single time. If you build a ship, an aircraft that's pretty balanced all round, then it's in a scenario where it can win 
most of the it, it's that it's not going to win in a scenario where it's uh, the enemy has to play to their strengths but at any point the enemy's not able to play to their strengths because they are so orientated around one strength in the other area they're going to be weak in it and zero's weakness was that their structure integrity etc and other things were just not as strong they were good aircraft but they were just not as strong and they start taking damage there's not a they can't take as much damage so when you do doing things like the pack weave etc and other operations in other tactics to counter the zero's ability to basically dogfight and dodge, you you have mucked them up completely. Thunder Cam, the fluffy research assistant making miles for a fluffy research assistant camera. Um there might be one of those on the neck on the computer build or when I build the tower. What are you after? When it's over, we'll go for a longer trip. How's that sound? I'll walk you all the way around the airfield. All right. Thank you. Re-aircraft tactics versus capability. Please see Gloucester Gladiator and Malta. Exactly. But also the Gloucester Gladiators and Malta had the advantage of they just weren't expecting. No one expects the Gloucester Gladiator. Like, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, no one expects the Gloucester Gladiator to do what the Gloucester Gladiator does. And look, our fluffy research assistant wants your undivided attention. He always wants my undivided attention. He's a very good fluff. And I think off topic, did the World War One Allied powers have any idea of how the, to divide up the high sea fleet as from reading chapter 37, 38 of Moscow? Just in case they didn't. They were debating it. No one actually had any idea of what they wanted to do. They had lots of ideas in their minds of what they wanted to do, but no one had any ideas of what they'd really like to do. Way to other science technology. One hour before he pauses World War II capital ship construction, Churchill learns basic stats on the Amato class, because besides possibly fitting his plans, what do you think he did might have been his response? Um, order something bigger and better. Which at that point the British could possibly have actually got out if they made it a priority, and probably all the aircraft carriers as well. Bigger and better aircraft carriers. You've probably seen something like the Audacious class ordered earlier. Also, and the coming also, also Wildcats have radios, a big bonus for 2v2 and many versus many fights. Yeah, well, coordinating firepower does tend to work. Time to focus. Will there ever be in place for armor on a modern ship warship? I. Me, uh, we've been seriously debating this in build pumps. And the idea we're coming up with slowly and slowly again is that you might, modern ship, future ships might well have armored pods, basically, survival, a survival pod area that the crew retreat to to fight the ship from. And run the ship from and if everything else gets damaged that armored pod survives and can get itself home somehow which is basically oh i'm forgetting the um, space game eva online what they do there Dr. Clark, have you ever heard about Task Force Admiral Volume 1 American Carrier Battles? Uh, it depends. I've heard of a book like that, but is that a game? Uh, that could also be a computer game. Mm. When is that video on Band Books? It's sort of planned for a Christmassy special, but it may or may not drop off the list of the Christmassy videos, because I've got lots of videos planned for Christmas. Hello, yes, come back. Good boy. Thank you for and they might not, but I suspect the RM will take the Deflingers, Baden, Ben, and any of the rest of the best of the fleet that they fancy first. In many ways, the scuttling was convenient. It was very useful. Thunder Caravan, Spanish Inquisition and Gloucester uh, Gladiators? Now, that would be a scary combination. Spanish Inquisition and Gloucester Gladiators, just where would you hide from them? And I'm more annoyed that there is no info on who wanted which ship. That's because they were all still debating it. 
and there were different people putting forward different proposals. There were the French proposals, the Italian proposals, the Spanish, uh, not the Spanish proposals, the American proposals. There are lots of different proposals put forward over who we get what. And now, Americans, going back to 30 knot carriers, I remember a story about Abdiel Mindlayer overtaking USN Task Force during the Suez Crisis. Now, I think about it, how can we do USN? Ah, uh, it happens. Abdiel Mindlayers overtake lots of people, mainly because the British consistently lied about how fast they were and played it down. Eve on, uh, no, no, can't we go to Eve Online? Yes, thank you. Frank Sonnet, I've seen. Did you help Drac blow torches at that tomorrow? No. Carl Cameron, so your idea is to build a modern armed version of what they did to some of the ship, 20s, 30s target ship. Pretty much. It worked. They kept the crew alive. And that, it's the sort of scenario we're looking at. Not long. We're in Japan. The next one after this is the minor powers, and then it's over, and then it then it should be through. Okay, good one. There's another. So, what will be the Halloween special? Ghost ships? Ships believe sunk, only to pop up again in battle? No. No. I don't think ghost ships. Uh, no, probably not. That that probably won't be the Halloween special. I don't tend to do Halloween specials. As a rule, my family isn't that into Halloween. Um, no, sorry, frankly, someone should write a book covering each of the high AC fleet division proposals. That probably would be an interesting book. I think John Jordan has looked at that. I seem to remember discussions, but I haven't actually seen a book. Um. I too. If you could choose to build vanguards for any navy, what guns and type of uh, type of no, what would you, weapons would you choose to build? Ah, uh, ship would you choose to build? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. Honestly, if I'm gonna build in the, not that period, I'm probably gonna build them for the Royal Navy. I would honestly like to churn out something with 15-inch 45s, because that could use a lot of the build facilities we already had available. Or 16-inch guns, as in what they had on Nelson and Romney. Uh, treble turrets, renowned layout, or renowned repulse-style layout, and just churn them out as quickly as possible. First one, let's see. If Rommel captured a part of the Suez Canal, uh, Suez on the coast, would Nelsons roll up the other end and blast away until the new canal is formed? No, but the Nelsons might well roll along the canal and bl blast away any German presence along the canal. This is the other thing for the Germans, the other real problem, out, problem uh, uh, the other really problematic thing with getting close to the coast and close to those areas. You get closer to British big guns. And one of the factors you often forget about in the North Africa campaign is the sheer amount of heavy firepower the Royal Navy tended to bring along to support the, the army whenever it was happening along the coast. They would turn up, they would bring the full for, uh, the full fireworks effects that they could bring along, and it did cause upset. Thank you, Colin Cameron, for Dr. Reeves. But there are, he, please don't, he has had plenty. There are plenty sitting in the car. He is being a little bit prima donna tonight. tonight. He has been made a lot of fuss of. Um, it doesn't help that he was made a very big fuss of by everyone in the hotel who thinks he's gorgeous. I have to deal with the ego afterwards. And he's a good boy. He is good. Even though he's currently kissing himself in the mirror. Dogs aren't supposed to look at each other themselves in the mirror. They're not supposed to like it. Mine kisses himself in the mirror. No, no idea. Um, come on, guys. Someone did write the book on the uh, Austrian Korean Marine, Austro-Hungarian Korean Marine Division on the Yugoslavia, Italy, Greece, Romania, France. Hmm. Um, no. 
Uh, guess what? Sirius had had her radios. They were incorrectly grounded and were virtually useless because of interference. I had a clarification on the radio zone, including the information about the problem. Yeah. Fur done. I'm hoping for a night battle of Guada Canal specialist for a ship to be around the 80th anniversary. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, Tedroid, does it HSS uh, steel count, uh, high sea fleet steel count as pre atom bomb steel? Theoretically, if it's still down there. Uh, uh, Dr. Clark, fluffy research there. My boss is back in the morning. We start watching the new Lord of the Rings series. Wish me luck. Good luck. It's a good series. Um, I have to say, I'm kind of interested in House of the Dragon, but I haven't yet started watching it. But SWAT, the new series of the season of that's out on, on Netflix, and I've been very happily devouring that. Um, I just wonder, can you give us some more info and opinion on the Espera convoy? Can I please defer that to when I'm at home? <laughs> For reasons of my notes are all at home and then unwritten up nicely. <laughs> but please feel free to ask that when I get back on the one of the brew ships when I get out back, ask me and I will have my notes ready for it. Uh, Michael Cooch, 1937, you're in charge of IGN procurement. You can design one ship of any class, then put them into series production. What ship of uh, what should you choose and what characteristics would it have? Um, well, <laughs> honestly, I would take the most reliable destroyer design I have. I would turn it into an anti-summary warfare vessel, and I would mass produce it. And I would make it as mass producible as I could, in as many yards as I could. In 1937, that's what I'd be doing if I was the Japanese. I'd also probably be secretly adapting various tankers and other ships so they could take uh, become escort carriers in wartime and have all the components necessary to make them into escort carriers already built and sitting in warehouses, but that's it. That's it. When I said vanguards, I actually meant recycling the guns of existing ships in a, as a way to quickly uh, make get a new, more capable one. Um... Honestly, for that to be a viable option, you need to have quite good guns in the first place. The British were lucky. They had 15-inch guns. Uh, for other navies, they didn't necessarily have guns which were as good as the 15-inch 42s available. Don't ask me. If they had an obsolete dreadnought belonging to a minor power like recent Tobruk, during the siege, then Tobruk would probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't probably have fallen. It would probably been a very big issue for them to circumnavigate. They would have probably had to bomb that thing quite heavily. But again, if it's been beached so it can't sink, then you can just... And it's not sinking, so you don't have to worry about it floating. You basically just pour concrete into compartments you're not using, and you just cover the thing up with as much steel and other stuff as you can get and turn it into a floating fort sitting in the middle of the harbour blowing away with its guns at anything that comes in range. Um, that's pretty much what you're doing. Hello, 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 you good boy. You want a nice long, a nice long wander at some point today. Mm -hmm. Take care, Totoro. Did I hear something? Uh, did I hear something about atom bomb? I hope not. I don't think I said anything about atom bomb. And one last agreement. Stupidest navy in World War Two. Um. Oh, good lord. Not really a stupid navy. Most of them understand their own problems. There are a couple of stupid governments, and I think that's a toss-up between the Japanese and the German as to which one's the most silly at various points in that they realize there are strategic issues and they still go ahead with them. Pretty well, don't see. You have to choose anyone. Which are great effect on war? Casablanca or Fletcher class? Fletchers. But that's because I have a sort of Fletchers on my uh, are cool destroyers. If it wasn't for the tribals, they'd possibly be, you know, my favorites. More at least some of my favorites. Mm.
Uh, two. After Skull and Curd, you're put in charge of deciding which two to four high seas fleet capital ships are to be returned to Germany. Which do you pick to best sabotage the future German Navy? Oh. Oh. Battle cruisers. Some of their really mixed everything battle cruisers that are, n are absolute nightmares to maintain. Don't give them an actual class so they can't standardize on anything. Give them something absolutely terrible. Like give them one of something and one of something else. And uh, just make sure they're, yeah, technically terrible. Thanks a lot. I love, I love she help. Actually, that's, uh, that's uh, just to really say, uh, too, we've got the obvious about it, and we're the same reaction and restriction replacement historically. Yeah. It's either pre dreadnoughts or I send them battle cruisers. <sighs> For example, see, where did, what were the gay class video idea come from? Um, that was a super chat from Vision, which I flashed up at the beginning. I don't know, do bear in mind it wouldn't be prudent for a career move from the colonial rush, not when and if you want to work immediately. No specific about that by Dr. Clark. Um, I, I tend to call a spade a spade, which might be to suggest why I have the level of success I do. Um, if I'm ever nice about things, that's usually because there's a good reason to be. Uh, I'm, as a rule, quite sarcastic and fairly rude. And Simon Cowell learned his... Uh, this copied me when it came to the trials I hide. Hmm. They mean steel from ships high sea fleet that is still in the discover. It's useful scientifically. Mm, post nuke test steel is bad for such criminals, so they use old steel for it. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. But I heard that new steel made from ore now is okay since there are no more radioactive dust particles floating in there. Um, there's still stuff from Chernobyl and a few other things, but it's lesser than it was. I think it's the criteria. Uh, for example, what early war loss could the RNS have suffered but didn't that would have been really bad for them? Um, honestly, losing any of the floating dry docks. If you lost the floating dry docks early, any of them early, that would have been problematic. Come on, it won't be long. Time to I might be anyone who loves county class the destroyers. No, they're cool. They're good ships for their time. If there was one to fix, one fleet, which would it be? Oh, if I was fixing things, it'd be the Royal Navy and it'd be sloop production. I'd actually have them building more sloops from about 1930 onwards. I'd have them matching sloop production. I'm not sure how I'd get them crewed, probably hand them out to the various Commonwealth navies. But I don't know. What is the problem? Mm -hmm. Let me get a second. This is the one advantage of having a col uh, having someone. Hello. I don't know. <sighs> I know old steel is used for very sensitive atomic measurements and experiments. I think it is still, and I think that's also recall some of the um, steel piracy that was taking place under the uh, on the various ships in the um, 
South China Sea and in, in, in Southeast Asian waters. Hello, John Sykes. New steel has radioactive material in it from level sensors, uh, levels, uh, in it from level sensors used in the blast on circuit, as well as scrap steel used for feed. Hmm. Cool. Hello. We're now into the minor navies. There weren't really that many questions for the minor navies, sadly enough. Not only deserved it, certainly. But they were pretty darn good. I think I realized why the fluffy research assistant is making the noise he's making. Ah, I will deal with that. Oh, one thing. I managed to, today I actually had fun. Um, while driving along, I drove past White Farms, the cheese makers. Uh, those who have watched this channel long enough will know that I am a bit of a cheddar cheese fan, and I do like cheddar. Uh, I do go to Cheddar Gorge, and I do have Muzella of the Cheddar, uh, the Cheddar Gorge Cheese Company, the little cow that wanders uh, wander around I occasionally take pictures of. Um, and you will see that if you go to my Instagram feed, uh, some of the older pictures. Um, but I went to, I managed to call into White Farm uh, Shop today, the White Farm Cheese Company and their, che uh, their cheese shop, and it was very, very nice. There was lots of lovely cheese there, including some cheese they make, which only sell they only sell there, which I never knew about before. So, cool. And that's, how do I put this? Considering I bought cheese there when I was there, that's the opposite of me, that's the opposite of a paid for ad. That's, uh, I paid for the cheese, had it, it was lovely, and I'm telling you all about it. Because <laughs> I know cheese is important to quite a few people who enjoy history. Uh, cheese does seem to go with historians. Okay. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Colin Cameron, if the move by Italy into the passes in the Tyrol, uh, uh, Tyrol to deter the invasion of Austria had blown into a war between Germany and Italy, would we have seen naval battles or just land? Just land. Honestly, I'm not sure how much anything naval would have happened. They'd have had to go around Spain and France, and it would have been a case of, you're not fighting in the English Channel, the Royal Navy will just go, no. Uh, there might have been some interesting actions around the world in terms of trade interdiction, etc. going on, but the British might well have just sealed off the Straits of Gibraltar and gone, no one's getting through, so no war, thank you very much. Um... Uh, Argy, what would change if the Liberty Ship Program was changed so the ships are faster and larger while not cutting the numbers uh, too, too much at minimum 22 knots? Uh, it would have made the job for the submarines U-boats astronomically impossible. If they are, if the convoys are proceeding on at that fast, they might get one or two shots maximum before they're past them. So it would change the convoy war quite dramatically. But it would also mean that you would have to have maximized turbine production because there is no way you're getting those ships up to that with triple expansion engines. Massinger, if you were in charge of explaining to Iceland why they're invaded, how do you make them understand why the British are invading? You have no military. Germany's just taken over Norway. Good luck. Frank Swallow, Dr. C, if you could choose a minor navy to be in control of Axis Navy, who for and how would they do? Oh, I would pick, if I was going to do it, it's sort of kind of strange, Axis Navy, um, if I'm going to do anyone, I would actually put the Dutch in charge of the Japanese. Might be interesting. Because the Italians produce a fairly balanced fleet. The Dutch have plans for a balanced fleet. The Japanese produce a fairly balanced fleet, but the Japanese need to be slightly more realistic in what they're building, and that's the thing the Dutch bring to them, and that would actually make a much stronger fleet. Um, also, they actually do have a good connection. I would be... Minor navies. 
I think the interesting thing would have been if the Swedes had been in charge of the Germans. That would have definitely produced an interesting fleet. The Finnish are pretty darn cool, but the Swedes... Yeah. Have that by any chance uh, supplied the G? Have they that by any chance supplied G that casualty of a certain nailing agent? I don't think White Farms did. Although they have been winning awards for 150 years, which they've got in banners literally everywhere you walk. They, we have won awards every year for 150 years, and you're going, I know, I like your cheese, but there are a lot of banners saying that here. I can see why you're proud of it, but surely one banner will be enough? Oh, too. I just wondered if the Dutch could have brought 13 half inch guns from the UK as potential armaments and battle cruisers instead of the 11 inch guns that planned for the 10 and 47s. The British would probably have sold them 14 inch guns quite happily. In fact, they would have loved to have sold them 14 inch guns because they had a twin turret and everything designed up. So it could have been a 6 14 inch gun ship. Actually, I lived within a few miles of the cheese rolling hill. For those not British, yes, we do chase cheese down hills, and yes, it is eccentric as sand. Yep. Thunder Gamma, historians are cheesy. We are, and we love cheese. Right, well, how bad did the rivalry between the British Army and Navy ever get? Um. The worst scenario is what happens to, well, to be fair, some officers are just not prepared for the level of politics which goes into strategic command. And you can honestly say the, oh, gentleman who won the Battle of the Real Plate, he just wasn't prepared for it. And the army and the RAF commanders put blamed everything on him and he wasn't ready for it. He didn't really understand that level of politics. They would have never got away with that with a different naval officer who was more prepared for senior command in that sort of station. But Harwood, yeah. He hadn't been trained for that level of command. He had been trained to be a commander in the South America. That's where he was. He wins the Battle of the River Plate. He gets promoted. Then you have, to, you have things for him. He does quite well. So you give him another post. He goes out to... The Middle East, he goes out to North Africa, he's in charge of Levant, and yeah, he gets eaten alive by the army and the RF commanders because they can. Because they can pass all the blame for all the problems going wrong to the Navy, and they will, because it protects their services. And the trouble is, he's not passing the buck at all. He's trying to deal with the problems as if they're constructive problems, not just going, shooting around, going, nope, that's your bulwark, that's your area, that's your area. Bing, 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 bang, bang. Uh, he doesn't play the t uh, political table tennis. Um, as a rule, most of them are pro fairly professional. Uh, but yeah, if you can pass the buck for things going wrong to another service, you always will do. Especially in those sort of scenarios where everyone's fighting for budgets and support. I see why does Hives not have military? They don't need one. They barely have a police force. They're very self-sufficient people and very lovely, but they just don't need one. Nowadays, they have a permanent American base there, and have done since World War II, since the British invaded, and then the British handed over to the Americans, so the British basically gave the Americans Iceland as a base, and the American, uh, Iceland kept them. Michael Coach, which nation would we put in charge of the Russian fleet? Probably the Finns, and they could actually do something with it. Wait, well, you talk about Swedes, but you talk about the cruisers, but why cruisers instead of improved survivory? Because they wanted something which could do independent global reach, and if they were trying, the only way you could improve on Sverig is actually to build an aircraft carrier, and they didn't want to go to that level, and they didn't think that was necessary in the Baltic, especially not as defense as the leader defensive fleets, so it was going to be under allied, uh, uh, going to be under allied air power. And they have a population under 340,000 for Iceland. But I also vis recommend visiting Iceland. It's beautiful. It is absolutely glorious. And the hot springs are phenomenal. Plus, 
they also do really good stuff with cheese, but they are obsessed with fish. And you can understand why it's a major part of their diet, but they are really obsessed with fish. No, you know, still good food. I think the night you and us are both on good enough terms with not to bother. No, not really. Asiran, after you battle one, the UK helps Iceland set up a military. What would you give them from uh, to form an Icelandic navy? If I was helping Iceland set up a military in after World War One to help form an Icelandic navy, let's be honest, they're actually one of the few. They could probably use some VW class destroyers, and that's probably what I'd send them. I, they don't really need much else. Oh, some sloops, some flare class sloops, and some VW class destroyers. And those two things together would probably provide them enough ships. Thanks, man. I think, why do people include when ships are struck from Navy lifts when they are lost? On Wikipedia, you can see it often mentioned. Why do they need to say so? It seems more administrative than it is useful. Because you have to remember that whilst we know, might know when a ship is sunk, if we don't know when it's sunk, or we don't at the time know it's sunk. So it's important to remember when it's struck off the list. This is when the Navy decides they no longer have it on a board as a piece to play with. And so therefore it no longer starts being part of their strategic and tactical calculus. So it's important to remember it's part of their strategic tactical calculus until that point. So that's why it's left there. Contacts. I saw something today in the news about India launching their first aircraft carrier. This is correct. It's their first domestically built aircraft carrier. It is launched and it is heading down the lines of commissioning. So yes, it's good. It's cool. And what do you think of the River Class Frigate World War II compared to the Flower Class Corvette? Completely different things. One is the bare bones basic thing to provide you with numbers. One is later on produced to give you to incorporate all the technologies and is upgraded to, to a halfway house between a corvette and a sloop. I.e., it's still not it's built with a mixture of merchant and naval standards of construction. Nice grunt. Don't worry, I understand it. When I don't eat, trust me, I get runty. Hence, I had. A whole pizza before we had a live tonight because I hadn't eaten today. I got on a subway. Actually, I had I, that's a lie. I I had had a um a a foot long tuna sub for breakfast, but that had been a long time ago. By the time I got to here. Swine 12, Science Technology. Uh, what minor Navy ships of steam and iron era would late and later would you have loved to see preserved as museum ships? Honestly, I'd have liked some of the coastal battleships preserved. Honestly, they, they are a cool type. And the fact they aren't, um, especially the Finnish ones, this one. I'd like to have some of the names be preserved. They are pretty cool looking ships, and I like them. Present, let's see. What class of cruisers were best to turn into CVs? Any other suites? Um, honestly, you need something which is basically a heavy cruiser hull. That's probably best to preserve. So if you're building something which is a heavy cruiser size hull in terms of strength and length and breadth, that is probably going to be best to turn into a carrier of any cruiser option. So if you're not building heavy cruisers, then you don't really have the option to convert into a, into a carrier. Uh, no, 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 no. We wouldn't stop the cod. The, the, the cod wars don't happen until post World War Two.
I have two. Maybe slightly off topic, but you're put in charge of rebuilding Starfleet after Wolf 3 and Wild 9. What do you do? <laughs> okay. Well, A. Defiant class would get built. B. Um, a carrier version of the galaxy. Far more of them would get built. Uh, with fighters. And um, C. I would probably stand up a um, Federation Marine Corps. I, they might be, they would be in addition to security, but I would be basically perceiving that we would, we need actual proper trained ground troops who can actually do, who are actually trained in ground warfare tactics to fight on ground. And I would have detachments of them along as uh, to uh, on each ship. Um, the same complement of each ship would have a detachment of security and a match strength of these troops, of marines, and their purpose of them would be for offensive operations. And they could back up security in providing troops aboard ship, should, should there be boarding actions, because, let's be honest, Borg do boarding actions, and they could back up, the security could back them up if they need to do land operations. And that's my just top my and my top three, Makos. Yeah, to an extent, because the Makos disappear, and frankly, I'd have said the Makos were useful. Archie, what and uh, Jeff Clark, what changes and what would happen if the Imperial Japanese Army and Imperial Japanese Navy rivalry had been a third party in 1947? We couldn't say uh, say in the uh, Imperial Japanese Air Force, i.e., so an Imperial Japanese Air Force. Uh, there would have been a civil war. That's the only way I can uh, I can say it. Frank Sonic, what is Star Trek's version of Guadalcanal? The entire Dominion War. My God, three Star Trek War three. Right? Question: I'd start building ships focused on the warship role. Oh no, you need some cruisers for the presence mission, but they don't need to have the families on board. Thanks a lot. This is technology. With being painted in the tush, what carries would be the best option for Netherlands, Greece, Finland, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, and whichever my name is, I've forgotten. Um, honestly, I'd be looking at light fleet carriers, which they did actually get post World War Two. Uh, basically, it's going to sound strange. The smaller you are as a nation, the more you want to rely on a ship which is survivable. So the more you're going to go towards the British end of the carrier spectrum rather than the American and Japanese ends of the carrier spectrum. Japanese tried to straddle, uh, straddle the middle of it. The Americans tried to go for maximum air group. And the British went for maximum survivability of hull. Right, so to see how much difference are heavy cruisers from light cruiser hulls. Heavy cruiser hulls tend to be more designed around the ability to and the structural strength to carry armor, which does have an impact on their ability to sustain the top weight on required from building up carrier the, sort of the things required for an air carrier operation, i.e., lifts, flight deck, hangar, island structure. All those things, you have a slightly stronger hull for a heavy cruiser than you do a light cruiser because it's designed to hang more armor. And it tends to have more internal subdivision, which gives it more rigidity. Right. Um, while someone has gone to sleep, I am going to make them very happy so i'm going to say final questions thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed i know tonight's been a little bit shorter but i am doing this through hotel wi-fi and i am on the road so thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed i'm going to say final questions then if like doors would be excellent in boarding actions they would i often think gimli would have been an excellent boarding for a boarding officer honestly that axe can find space Dr. C, if you wanted to turn a carrier into a cruiser, what is the best choice? Oh, you've got to pick one of the armoured carriers. Um, probably Indomitable, actually. Probably Indomitable. Favourite sci-fi cruiser design? Oh, Andromeda. The Andromeda Ascendant.
Thank you, Ramon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Melanie sixty four T, the HS Verdun, DG forty, Tanner Fedeka, RG, Dunrick Iron Hammer, Carl Gazabet. Thank you, nine six eight everyone. How many World War One destroyers the Iron have to throw at the Nazi Navy? They have about a hundred sitting around in various forms. Thank you, Wayne's World. Thank you, Frank Swallow, John Sykes. Uh, thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, everyone, for all your support. Chris LC, Bolatsky, RG, Anuk, IO2. Uh, thank you, Stafford. Uh, thank you, Sean. And thank you, Tech Covert 4. Um, Darius Rodowski, thank you. And I think I've said thank you, Ad, 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 but thank you, Ad Fab, Frank Spardo, and John Sykes. Night Hair Productions, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for all your support. Wouldn't be able to do it without you. Wouldn't be able to do it without the very generous super chat, super thanks, and everything you all do. Thank you very much for those. And thank you for the people who have signed up to the channel. Thank you to people who are patrons. Remember, the patron vote is currently still live. There are people say you're still able to vote in the patron vote for this month's patron choices. And uh, yeah, thank you. Take care. And I hope you enjoyed the series that's coming currently coming out, the um, 19th century cruisers. They're fun vessels, and I hope you enjoy them. And I'll see you again on Sunday when I'll be doing a, well, not a brew ships. It will be uh, questions till the brew runs up. So I look forward to any naval history questions you have for them. Take care, everyone. Have fun, and thank you. Hello, Christopher. Hello, Nautical Wolf. And thank you, Nautical Wolf. And then Greg Salsky. Thank you, everyone. And John Shea. Christopher, read the size of hand sewed guns. Uh, in real life, the seven and a half inch on the first two Hawkins were hand sewed in on the power mounts, but they were beyond the size of practical hand sewed guns. They were freaking awful. Freaking awful. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have fun.